released a couple of weeks ago maybe. What I plan on talking about tonight is the first story in the new Stephen King book, If It Bleeds. So being in quarantine, I don't have into that. So, I'm only going to be talking about the first one tonight. I'm going to try to keep it as spoiler free as possible, but I am going to be talking about the first story um, and my thoughts about it and my connections to Stephen King and what I think about it. It's not a review really, just kind of thinking out loud because I just finished it today. I'll just start first with the story itself. It's about a kid named Craig who, a friendship with like an older guy who moves into their neighborhood, their small town in Maine, and he starts reading to the guy. It's kind of reminiscent of that chapter in To Kill a Mockingbird, or where Jim reads to the old, the old racist lady. He just becomes attached to this guy, and some things happen. Nothing, nothing sexual, nothing like that. I don't want to go into, I'll try to stop right there and just kind of talk about my thoughts about the story. The thing about the first story, it's called Mr. Harrigan's Phone. It's very much in the vein of Stephen King's lesser horror stories. I wanted to try to pull as much, as many references to other things as possible to talk about the story. So it, it kind of reminded me of Sometimes They Come Back, uh, which is sort of about memory and family. Stephen King, as much as any other writer, writes about memory and about nostalgia uh, about as well as anyone that I know of. I mean, especially for a pop author. When you think about his level of popularity and the amount of thoughts about what it means to be a child, like he's still, even in his 70s, is able to remember what it's like to be a kid. And even though I think some of the the ways that he writes childhood now feel a little bit odd considering he's in his 70s. Like, he doesn't have the connection to being a child that he did when he was writing about kids from the 50s when you think about Stand By Me or The Body As It Was Called or even Sometimes They Come Back. Um, he writes much more eloquently about the 50s and 60s and even the 70s that he does about modern kids, but he's still making an effort. And I think that this story has an element of technology that it makes it difficult for a writer to actually engage with talking about technology. Stephen King still does that fairly well because the story is really about how the iPhone changed things, what technology means to older people. There is the relationship between people and then there's a relationship to technology. And I think Stephen King does a pretty good job of trying to write about this here, but the main character is a young kid. And I think Stephen King still sees himself as that person because I see the narrator of the story, but the other main character in the story is a, an 88 year old man. And Stephen King is closer, both in terms of age and mentality to that person. And so, you can see a lot of Stephen King's visions of technology in this story and sort of how he he thinks about the way that technology has changed people's lives. I mean, he's done that in the past. When the Kindle first came out, um, he had a story called uh, You Are, I think, and it was about the Kindle. He He has a really prescient way of looking at technology and being able to write about our fears. Um, and I don't think he quite hits the mark totally here. For example, there's always a problem about writing writing about the past when you know what happens in a way that feels sort of icky and cloying. And Stephen King kind of falls into that trap here a little bit where he's like, man, these iPhones, they're going to change the way we think about things. And if he had written that in 2007 when the iPhone was released, obviously that would be, whoa, look at this. But it's kind of looking back at a forward-looking technology, which makes it all the weirder. Um, but I think that's one flaw in the story that's strange for me. And the second thing that I, that I think doesn't quite work is there is nothing gross or weird about... Uh, the main character, Craig's relationship with Mr. Harrigan, this 80-year-old man. But it feels like a more antiquated idea than we see, I think, in 2020. Um, like I mentioned earlier in, in this live stream, 
To Kill a Mockingbird has a chapter that is specifically about this. Jim, Scout's older brother, he kind of destroys this racist old lady's uh, flowers in her front yard and has to go read to her as a punishment. And that feels very of the time in 1930s Alabama. That feels like something that people did. It felt very connected to what it means to have community because ultimately Atticus did it to teach Jim a, list, a, a lesson. And so that feels very authentic. But I, in, in 2020, when you have you know, a nine-year-old kid going to see an 88-year-old man, or this happened in 2004, that... It's a very sort of, it, it stretches uh, your sense of, uh, what's it called? Um, when you have to, you, you, you can't suspend your disbelief. That's what I was looking for. It's, it's harder to suspend your disbelief to think that a nine-year-old in 2004 becomes really enamored with an 88-year-old guy. And so I think that's, that's what, the major plot problem that underlies this story is, is that we have this story that's about this guy and this, this kid and this older guy getting along, but they're not really friends. And it, I don't know, I don't get it. It's not creepy and it's not weird. It's just out of place. It feels very much like it was done for the service of plot. Um, and I think that and yet, I think that it's still a successful story. I mean, the horror elements are relatively minor. It's more about the passage of time and how technology seems to speed things up. Um, but there's also some very satisfying sort of writing about revenge and death that I think Stephen King, that's right in his wheelhouse. And so it it's a story that very well could be you know, the Shawshank Redemption or the body, but has its own horror sort of creep show vibe to it as well. I mean, I could just as easily see this, you know, being made into a sort of creepy short film or an hour long episode of some horror show uh, because it has that, but it's mostly about people, uh, which also just kind of going through references and thinking about stories of this nature. Stephen King wrote a novel several years ago called Revival and uh, it was about a rock musician, <clears throat> heroin addict, who becomes involved with uh, this preacher who's very obviously a con man. And the writing in that story was all very human. It was about addiction. I think Stephen King writes about addiction pretty well. Um, he's a a little quaint about it sometimes, but that, that story really works. And that's, I'm going a long way to say that the end of the story has this Lovecraftian kind of amazingly horrific ending that you don't really see coming, but has been sort of littered throughout the story. And this is sort of like that. The story is more human than it is horror, uh, which I think Stephen King does really well. But there's still... When I read stories like this, I see why people have certain kinds of um, problems with King's writing when they think about, he, sometimes he feels like a Pollyanna where, you know, everything, even when things go terribly wrong, there is still a, a huge amount of hope in the way that he writes about things. And so even... This story is detached from realism even beyond the horror that is in it, if that makes any sense. But um, my plan is I'm going to read a story from, e from If It Bleeds. There are four novellas from If It Bleeds, which is Stephen King's newest book. I'm going to read each one and sort of give my own thoughts about it. Not really a review. I don't like reviewing things and giving numerical value to... Uh, to writing, but uh, just talk through what I think about it and see if I can do it on the fly. I'm not going to write down my thoughts and then read them to you. I just want to talk. And uh, so over the course of the next, say, four weeks, maybe I'll do one a week 
where I'll sit down and talk about Stephen King. And that's, uh, <laughs> thanks Tom. And so, uh, yeah, I just really, I really enjoy talking about Stephen King's works because even though he's a popular author and um, has sold a gajillion books, one thing I think is really fascinating about him is that he is an author who has the chops to back back it up. You know, when I read uh, authors who write popular stuff, it isn't all, there isn't always depth to it. And, you know, it's kind of entertaining, and you put it down, and you're like, yay, that was a fun roller coaster ride. But what I think Stephen King does really well is that he has a sense of humanity in everything that he writes that most people aren't able to grasp um, as writers, as horror writers especially. And that's what I really love about him. Um, like my one of my favorite books of his is one of the ones that most people hate the most. Uh, it's called Dreamcatcher, and it's about <laughs> it's about aliens. And but the setup to it is really great. It's about four friends who reconnect after some bad events in their lives to try to put the past behind them and just have a weekend of hunting that gets sort of overthrown by this alien invasion. And I think that that's a really super cool thing. Um, but yeah, that's really, that's really all, all of my thoughts about the first story. But uh, my hope is, yeah, like I said, to, to talk about Stephen King in a, in a broader way over the next few weeks because I'm a fan of his. I mean, I'm not, I know this page is supposed to be about my books and my writing, but writing is as much about reading as it is about writing. And uh, talking about what I read helps me to digest what I've read so that it can kind of make its way into my writing or I can see a new perspective or see something maybe in my own writing that I don't do so well. And so I hope you like this. Um, I'll be posting it to the page. So, uh, hey Melissa, um, I would love to read to you. Uh, probably not tonight. I was planning on uh, uh, ending this one fairly soon, but uh, I maybe for the next uh, live stream I can bring. I don't have the co a copy of the book in front of me, but uh, maybe next time I can certainly do a reading uh, for you guys. So um, if you have any suggestions about things you would like for me to do uh, related to Stephen King, talk about, we could talk about our favorite Stephen King books. I'm all about doing another one of these. Uh, I'll do an another live stream soon. And if you guys have suggestions, just go to the Facebook page 